wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So, uh, anybody ever been uh, drunk and intoxicated before? A couple hands, a few hands, good. Maybe not so good, but glad some folks can relate. Uh, into- intoxication tends to do what with our vision? It blurs it, right? Yes, it, it messes up how we see things. We begin to see double of something, or our vision becomes a little bit fuzzy. And losing your ability to see clearly is a, is a pretty obvious side effect. I think we feel in that moment. There's a few others, right? Sickness, uh, we begin to maybe perhaps lose our balance. Uh, it starts to damage our liver and our kidney. Uh, but there's also one in particular that we experience uh, that we don't really get until maybe after we start looking uh, back on that time of drunkenness. And intoxication impairs our judgment. We begin to make poorer and, and poorer decisions. We, we trade in sound reason for desires of the flesh. And that tends to introduce all sorts of brokenness into our own lives. And so what I want us to know is that we are oftentimes unknowingly guilty of this intoxication, but instead of with alcohol, with sin. Sin tends to blur our vision. It impairs our judgment and it has lasting negative impacts on those around us. So I, I kicked off with a rather uh, provocative question that you know, a handful of, of you may have, it may have applied and you were maybe scared to answer uh, and, and, and raise your hand. Many of you were not, so it was good to know that, that I'm not alone in that. But it's in fact the very reason that you may have been scared or hesitant to raise your hand um, that we'll explore in the text today, right? You don't want people to judge you. you. You don't want people to look differently at you or treat you less than and have the wrong idea about you. And that's exactly what the readers of this text are accused of doing. They are welcoming in a rich man into their midst and, and treating him with favoritism at the same time welcoming in a poor man and relegating him to sit at the floor or to stand around the room. They are showing, in other words, partiality or, or favoritism to one person, and thus dishonoring the other. And so what I I want us to know is that we all do this, and so we need to understand the seriousness of this offense. So our our main question, if you're taking uh, notes tonight, is going to be, what are the implications of showing partiality? What are the implications of showing partiality? So looking again at James chapter 2, verse 1, my brothers. And so quickly, I want to pause here because these first two words set the tone for how we should read the rest of this passage, Uh, right? We we oftentimes tend to read the Bible and overlay our own past experiences on top of it. So as we read uh, a passage like this that includes correction or includes rebuke, 
we tend to read that with how we may have been corrected and, wait, and how we may have been rebuked. And so uh, as, is, as we read this, it, it's easy to read this as if James is starting to berate the readers, saying, how dare you treat others differently? And he's pointing the finger at them. Um, but I don't want to, to overstate this point, um, but this is actually the, the fourth time that we read this phrase of my brothers. We, we see it three times in the first chapter. We, we see it again in, in a few verses as my beloved brothers. And so the tone this sets, I believe, captures the essence of truth in, in love. James is aware of the mistakes that these readers uh, are, are making, and what he writes is not a, a chastisement or, or a scolding, but rather a loving correction to say, hey, brothers, our Father is not pleased with how you've been acting and how you've been conducting yourselves. That there are those that are coming into your congregation that are seeking Jesus, and you're messing it up. You're pushing them away. And so with that in mind, let's, let's continue on through verse 7. Starting in verse 1, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? So we, we start with this command to show no, no partiality as you hold the faith in Christ Jesus. And so the question is, what is partiality? So the Greek word that's been translated as partiality or, or favoritism, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it, all right, I'm not Alex, but it literally means receiving the face. So it, in other words, we might would say to judge a book by its cover, which means to make judgments about people based on their external appearance. And so this command is ultimately saying that having presumptions about people based on their external appearance is just not compatible with following Jesus. James then outlines how this could be playing out in the context of the readers. We see two uh, characters here introduced. A rich man who has a gold ring and fine clothing contrasted with a poor man who has shabby clothing. So then why contrast the rich man and the poor man? Well, at, at this time, and this might seem surprising to some of you because we don't really see this today, but there was a massive amount of corruption in the political and judicial systems. And wealthy individuals would raise these trivial lawsuits against poorer landowners, and then they would take them to court, knowing that these poorer landowners weren't going to be able to defend themselves. They weren't going to be able to pay for whatever judgment there was. And so these judges were corrupt, and they would often then rule in favor of the wealthy individuals, perhaps for some of a you know, kickback. And ultimately, the payment for that judgment would be taking the land from the poor landowners and giving it to the wealthy, leaving the poor landowners with nothing or having to become servants on the very land that they used to own. And so this context helps us understand some of the conclusions that James reaches as he takes this sort of a hypothetical illustration and actually makes it a description uh, of what's going on as these men come into the congregation. Looking at verse 3, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. So they've welcomed the rich man and are directing him to this place of honor within the assembly or the gathering. Uh, the word here is synagogue, which should sound familiar, right, for, for assembly, right? We're all familiar with the place where Jewish people uh, meet, and so... Uh, that implies that the, the audience of James's letter were likely Jewish Christians meeting in a synagogue-type setting. Uh, 
And so many synagogues would have been a rectangular room, much like uh, you know, where we are right now, a little bit smaller. And there would have been seating around what was the pulpit, typically relatively central to the room. So there would have been seating around this, this pulpit. And then so there would have been standing room perhaps around the end, as well as um, obviously places to sit uh, at the floor. And so in the, the center of the room with that pulpit is typically there would be a stand uh, a little more ornate than this uh, with scrolls. And whoever was uh, teaching would stand there at the center and read from the scrolls um, or offer teaching. And so we uh, look at the seating around the room. And typically among this seating would have been a place that was kind of designated as for a special guest or for some kind of distinguished uh, visitor. Uh, and so a lot of context, but it's important because it begins to help us uh, understand the seriousness of the offense that James is talking about. It isn't simply just a short, right, rich guy walks in, hey, you sit over here. Poor guy walks in, hey, you just sit down over there, maybe stand um, at the back of the room. But rather, here's this rich man wearing a, a gold ring and, and fine clothing, and they're saying, Hey, you are deserving of more honor. You are deserving of our time and to be distinguished amongst our visitors. And so you sit here in this good place. And as they look at the poor man, as he comes in with shabby clothing, uh, shabby coming from the same root word as filth or filthy, which was used in, verse, in chapter 1 to describe sin. So not simply just shabby clothing that we think of, right, not too shabby. Um, I say that quite often, but rather something that would more resemble homelessness. Uh, somebody who's wearing clothes that you know, no other person uh, would wear, that if you went to Goodwill, you would say, why would they have accepted such clothing? And, and again, the ties to sinfulness as well, of, of shabby, filthy sinfulness. And so that they've now determined that he is of less worth because of his external appearance of, of poverty and dirtiness, and that he deserves to stand around the outside of the room where perhaps nobody has to, to look at him or to sit down out on the ground at people's feet, which would have been considered uh, a, a pretty big insult. And I think likely also an insult today if somebody were to walk in and we see open seats in, in the pews, if we were to say, hey, uh, yeah, if you want to stand at the back or sit on the floor, I'm sure you can find a spot. And so in, in doing so, James is telling them in verse 4 that they've made distinctions and have become judges with evil thoughts. So we see again that, that term judges with evil thoughts. So he's pulling into view here the context that the readers would have understood of these corrupt judges with evil thoughts who were ruling in favor of the wealthy and ruling against the poor man simply because of their economic status. And so he now he's likening them to these judges that the readers likely would have viewed as ones with evil thoughts. So two individuals have come into their church, we'll say, and they've received the face or, or judged the book by its cover, and they've assigned a value to them simply based upon their external appearance. And the initial offense here isn't where they tell them to go sit down, but rather it's at their sin-intoxicated view as they first lay eyes on these men. Right? What comes out of their mouth is simply just an overflowing of the sin that is in their heart. James isn't laying out a new rule for them. Right? We, we, we understood that from the old law. We're not just dealing with rules anymore. He's addressing the heart. He's not saying, hey, rich man, poor man, just so they don't feel different, let's go ahead and just make sure they sit in the same seats. But rather he's saying, you're looking at these people all wrong. And it's because of the condition of your heart. This brings me to my first point. And that is that a worldly view leads to wrong judgment. A worldly view leads to wrong judgment. I mean, does the world not assign values based on externally defined criteria? Right? Do we not just take a look at folks and say, oh, they're rich or they're poor. Now I know how to treat them. Do they not say, are they black or white or Hispanic or some other ethnicity? Do they have uh, tattoos? Do they have the right bumper sticker supporting the right presidential candidate on the back of their car? Maybe that'll tell me whether I should honk at them or not when they pull out in front of me. 
you see our de- default position is broken. Getting to know people is hard. We would rather just have a look at them, assign them a couple of worldly labels, and then move on. We have enough going on in our lives. So if I can just get the, same, get the, the correct idea about somebody, and, they'll, and I'll know whether or not I should spend more time rather to, to get to know them, or should I just pass them up? It's easier to just receive their face or to look at the cover of the book and then to judge them in such a way to say whether or not they are worthy of our time or worthy of getting to know. And we see this in the church, right? Somebody isn't wearing the right clothes, and we think maybe if we just don't talk to them, they won't want to come back, right? If somebody comes in here and they appear poor, it's like maybe they aren't able to contribute the tithes that we need them to contribute to help our budget out, right? We, we want the rich people to come in, and perhaps they'll be able to tithe more. Or perhaps it's the color of their skin is different, right? Well, maybe they're at the wrong place. Maybe there's a church down the road that'll better suit them. We do this with doctrine or or theological labels too. We hear that somebody is a Catholic or a Methodist or perhaps they're Arminian or Calvinist, that they believe differently about the end times and we assume them to be lost causes, that they've missed the mark and that they're no longer worth talking to or engaging in conversation with. That there's no point in even trying that they're going to need the help of God and there's nothing that we can do. And yet, isn't that each of our stories? Or perhaps they do have the right labels, right? Then they're worthy of taking more of an interest in. I would argue that this is why people dress up when they come to church. They know that we're prone to think this way. They know that we'll be more welcoming of them if they're just wearing the nice-looking clothes, right? We... If we see somebody that we that we has the right clothes or, or that has the right appearance, then we give them this proverbial place to sit in our lives because they're wearing the right clothes. They look the same as us. They think the same about politics or theology. Right? We elevate them to this status of worthy of our time and resources simply because of how they present themselves. And we fall into the trap of wrong judgment because we look at them with a worldly view. So James begins to correct the readers in the next couple of verses, giving a glimpse in how God might view these men. He poses to the readers a couple of questions, starting in verse 5. Listen, my beloved brothers. And we see that tone set here again, right? Hey, brothers, I love you. You're getting this wrong. Consider what the Scripture says. Or in this sense, consider what Jesus Christ teaches. Listen, my beloved brothers, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? Where might James be referencing there? The the Beatitudes, right, from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We read in uh, Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so by having the poor man Uh, stand or or sitting at their feet, James writes that they have dishonored him. They've insulted him. They've treated him shamefully as if being poor somehow made him any less important than the rich man. And and what's ironic and what James pulls into view here is this isn't just a, a poor man, but this is potentially a man that God himself has chosen to be heirs of the kingdom. Right? He's saying, hey, brothers, this is your brother. And so it's not just wrong that they've dishonored the poor man, but also that they've elevated the rich man. And again, reiterating that this isn't just a rich man from an example, an illustration. This is actually a description of things that were going on. So they wouldn't have just seen this rich man. Uh, right? This isn't just, a, a, like I said, an illustration. But rather, they would have seen this rich man and known the wrong that he's doing in the community, known how that he is treating the poor um, folks in their community, and even the poor how he's treating the poor men that are actually walking into their congregation. Right? These men are raising lawsuits against the believers, the poor landowners, and they're oppressing them. And by doing so, these rich men are blaspheming the name of God. Paul concludes a similar chain of thoughts uh, with 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? 
But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. And these New Testament writings actually echo that of the Old Testament. If we look at Leviticus chapter 19, and we'll we'll come back here in a few minutes, so, so keep that in mind. We look at verse 13. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. And then picking up in verse 15, you shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But in righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. So these things are exactly what the rich men are being accused of. And yet, because of the reader's worldly view of these men, having elevated wealth as this uh, characteristic of importance, It's caused them to judge these men wrongly. They've given them this seat of honor. They've chosen to ignore the wrong and the oppression that these rich men are carrying out on the poor, the, the the injustice that they're participating in in the courts. And for what? In hopes that these rich men might stop oppressing them? Right? That these rich men perhaps would pity those in the congregation and not come after them with lawsuits? You see, they have a a narrow view, a worldly view uh, of themselves and others, and they can't rightly judge them because of it. And my concern is, too, that we are intoxicated with a worldly view, that we would rather be disobedient to God in exchange for material things and good standing in the world. Is Is our vision of others so blurred? that we would view them as less than or not worthy of our time if they walked in these doors. And so we understand our worldly view leads to wrong judgment, but as we see in the dishonoring of the poor man, our second point, a wrong judgment leads to condemnation. Again, a wrong judgment leads to condemnation. And this isn't just a a worldly condemnation for the one being judged, right? This isn't just embarrassing for the poor man to have to sit on the floor, but rather also an eternal condemnation for the one who's doing the judging. And James lays out the case for that as we read verses 8 through 11. Starting in James 2, verse 8, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So James runs through a few examples here that helps the readers rightly see the implications of partiality and the seriousness of that. But he starts this sequence pointing back to the heart of the law, the royal law, or in other words, the law belonging to the king. And this shouldn't be unfamiliar, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. When the Pharisees were trying to to stump Jesus by asking him what is the greatest commandment, what is Jesus' response? In Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. And he, Jesus, said to him, the Pharisees, you shall, love the God, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Right, so this is the royal law, to love God with every fiber of your being, with your mind, your body, your spirit. Similarly, love your neighbor as yourself. We tend to show ourselves kindness and mercy, right? When we trip up, we have a little bit more patience with ourselves, right? Because we know what our intentions were, right? We meant to do the right thing. But at times, this is hard for us to do with others. We, we typically see them in a moment, And now we know all we need to know about them. And this isn't a new concept. We can 
go back to the law that these commandments are the foundations of. Let's return back to Leviticus uh, 19. All right, so the laws we read earlier in verses 13 and verses 15 are summarized in verse 18, or as Jesus says, depend on or foundational upon verse 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So James has laid out a case for what they are doing wrong, right? Showing partiality. He's shown them why it's wrong, both according to the Old Testament, according to the old law, but also that it goes against the very heart of the law. It goes against every law. And that is love God and love your neighbor. And so then he begins to answer our main question. What are the implications of showing partiality? So we, we might be tempted to think that it's not that big of a deal, right? Showing partiality it, it's pretty low on the totem pole, right? If somebody goes to hell and their only offense is partiality, then maybe they go to you know, the general population side of things and not to that special place reserved for the murderers or the adulterers. And rather, James says, partiality or murder, you will stand condemned. That you are still convicted by the law as transgressors. That if you live a perfect life and you kept the entirety of the law and that partiality was your only offense, that you're still guilty of all of it. He then utilizes two examples of laws that we would all, I believe, nod our head to, saying, yes, those are pretty condemnable offenses, right? Murder and adultery. And he chooses these two in order that we may begin to rightly see the implications of partiality, that we might see even what we might would call the smallest of sins as equally condemnable to murder. And what James does so well here, and as you've seen in other examples, is that he's following Christ's outline and doing the same that Christ is doing in his teachings, right? These two examples should sound uh, familiar. Following the famous Beatitudes and during the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is addressing similar topics. He's taking sins that perhaps only the person committing them would know, right? Like anger and lust, and he elevates those to the same as murder and adultery. Jesus says in Matthew five twenty one. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And then continuing in verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone that looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so, in the same way, James lays out the case for partiality, that it puts us on par with those of the murderers and the adulterers, in the same way that Christ does with lust and with anger. It makes sense to us that murderers would spend an eternity in hell. And so what we need to understand is that showing partiality is deserving of that same punishment, that even the small sins are an offense against a holy and good God. Right? These are the implications of showing partiality. These are the just rewards for wrong judgments driven by our worldly view of others. So then let's read how James concludes this passage in James 2 verses 12 and 13. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so we reach our final point this evening, and one that we would do well to remember as it echoes verse 13. Condemnation awaits the merciless, but mercy awaits the merciful. Again, that's condemnation awaits the merciless, but mercy awaits the merciful. And again, James here is building on, if not just simply reminding the readers of the teachings of Christ. He, again, with connections to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. 
For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And so we see this played out actually in the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, where we are as as a church right now um, on Sunday mornings typically. Right, we see this servant, he's in a massive amount of debt. And so his master comes and he says, hey, it's time to pay. And the servant begins to beg. He doesn't have the funds. He doesn't know when he's going to be able to get him. And so he begs for patience from this master. And does the master give him patience? Not only that, but he forgives all of his debt. And so then the forgiven servant takes this newly found freedom, and he goes to another servant who owes him money. And he says, hey, it's time to pay up. You owe me money. And that servant can't pay. And so this recently forgiven servant says to throw him in jail. The master finds out about this and ultimately confronts the servant, and he turns him over to the jailers. And so the passage concludes, And so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And so again we see that condemnation awaits the merciless, but mercy awaits the merciful. So then what does living mercifully look like? Well, James actually tells us in verse 12, So speak and so act as those to be judged under the law of liberty. Law of liberty seems a little contradictory here, right? I think the closest example that we might have to this is the Constitution. Uh, It embodies the ideas that helps its citizens to live freely. It places certain bounds on uh, on our activity such that everybody else can continue on in the freedoms that we have in this country. And as believers, having been previously slaves to sin, bound by the desires of our flesh, we've now been made new creations and given freedom in Christ from the oppressive rule of sin. We are now citizens of heaven, and our freedom exists in the bounds of this perfect law, the law of liberty, or as James says, the royal law, which fundamentally, again, is love God and love your neighbor. And so James is saying two things here, right? Let every word that you speak and let every uh, action that you perform be measured against this perfect law. And that sounds pretty daunting, which is the second thing I believe James is saying here is knowing that you will not be perfect according to this law, you should still expect mercy from Christ. And knowing that you will receive undeserved mercy should give you the necessary perspective, the the, the right view, the godly view of others to be able to extend that undeserved mercy, whether they be rich or poor or any other sort of externally defined criteria. Our words and our actions should be directed at both the rich and the poor as if we will be judged by God because we will be. We will give an account uh, to God for the things done here on earth. Paul frames this image well in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And on that day, as you give an account to, to Christ, it's clear how he will judge you. He tells us in Matthew 7, verse 2. For with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Meaning that as we are to be judged under the law of liberty as believers, we'll stand before him blameless. We'll be deserving of death, and yet we will be given freedom. We'll be deserving of wrath, and yet we will be shown grace. We will be deserving of condemnation, yet we will be shown mercy. And it's because Christ's view of us is clear. It's not blurred. He views believers as a child of God for which he went to the cross and poured out his blood and endured God's wrath 
such that on that day of judgment, we could be presented blameless before God. Christ won't simply receive us at our face, but rather receive us at our heart, if I can utilize the same phrase. A heart that he has made new or can make new by his work on the cross. And that is James's instruction and caution here, as we don't have the certainty of one's eternal status when they first walk through the doors or we first see them in public as we go about life. That their external appearance does not determine their heart. So whether that person appears rich or, or poor or, or dirty or clean, we must stop looking at others with our sin-intoxicated view, our worldly view, because that just simply leads to our wrong judgment of them. And that wrong judgment leads to condemnation. Rather, we must pursue the godly view uh, of others. That produces righteous judgment that leads to mercy. And it points us and others to the work of Christ. So as much as I hope that the, the notes and the main points uh, have helped you and that you, that you remember them. Uh, ultimately, it's, it's Scripture uh, that's truly life-giving and, and it can help you in those moments. So I just wanted to close with a verse that we can hopefully pretty easily memorize that, that'll help us as we look at others uh, as image bearers of God, right? Potential siblings, brothers and sisters in God's family as opposed to perhaps our sin-intoxicated worldly view. And that verse is Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let's pray.